Hey there guys, so today we're going to be taking a look at the Tricoon HA4. Now this is a mini PC from a manufacturer that I really had never heard of, but they reached out to me and asked if I wanted to check out one of their new systems. Now this is rocking a Ryzen 7 7735HS. Don't let the 7000 on it fool you, it's actually just a refresh of the 6800H. But that does mean that we do get RDNA 2 graphics on here. And we do still get eight very powerful cores here. Now I went in with some pretty low expectations just because it's a company that I had never heard of before. They're only recently trying to get into the US market, but they have been around for quite a few years now. But I went in with very low expectations, just expecting to get a pretty standard box with a chip in there and the cooling was going to be kind of all over the place. But this is actually a extremely well-built machine. It is an all metal construction pretty much. Besides the lighting diffusion around the system, everything is pretty much just solid metal and it feels fantastic in the hand. It feels really, really well put together. It has a very industrial design look to it with visible screws that are just flush with the design of the system itself. And I think it actually works really, really well. It looks nice while not getting extremely stylized or anything like that. Like B-Link is one of the companies that I think is the most out there in terms of their designs and even color choices to the point where it might be off-putting for people that might want a more neutral design. And this, this is a neutral design while still having a premium design to it because it really feels solid. So overall, I'm actually really happy with the design of this thing. Now, in terms of ventilation and cooling, things look also really nice. I do appreciate the large power button and there is a reset switch in the front, but it's a recess switch so you don't have to accidentally press it. Now on the front we also do have a USB type C as well as two USB 3.0 ports and a headphone jack. At the back we're looking at two HDMI ports as well as a light switch. Now this switch is for the RGB lighting around it. It's kind of the gimmick of this system. Personally you might not like it. I think that the vast majority of people out there are going to either have it in the rainbow color or just have it off. Reason being is that for some reason they only let you swap between a limited amount of colors. So you have this rainbow streak around it, or you could go solid white, pulsing white, solid orange and pulsing orange, and then solid red and pulsing red. And then we're right back to the rainbow color. So very, very odd configuration there for the RGB. I hope that for the full release of the system, they change that and just give you more options because that was a very odd decision to make there. Now, a really nice inclusion is of course a 2.5 gigabit ethernet jack very very nice to see if you're someone that lives in a household where you're downloading a bunch of games because you either have a lot of systems because you're as insane as me and you own like 50 different computers or more likely you have siblings that also like to play video games then it's not a bad move to actually start to invest in some 2.5 gigabit ethernet jacks on your systems ssds are cheap enough Enough that you could pretty much load up your system with four terabyte SSDs for not that much money. And one of the coolest features that Steam actually has right now is the same network file transfer. So if you just downloaded the most recent update for Counter-Strike 2 and it's on your computer, well, there's no reason really for your brother's computer or your sister's computer to download the game from the Steam servers if the file's already on the network anyway. It just needs to communicate with your computer so that it just sends over the right file. And this could actually end up being significantly faster than any connection that you can have with Valve's own servers. Because at home, you might only have 300 megabit internet or 500 megabit or even all the way up to gigabit internet. But if in your own home network, you actually have 2.5 gigabit networking, that means that you're actually now transferring data multiple times faster than any kind of connection you can have. And at this point, the only limiting factor 
is really just going to be whether or not you have a hard drive or SSDs. If you have SSDs, then you're going to be more than capable of saturating a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet connection. So I'm really liking that a lot of systems are starting to include those because that's really just going to make that downloading experience in home a lot better. I personally use this feature a lot because obviously I have a lot of systems around as you've seen and it can get very hectic trying to transfer games onto all of these systems. Now, one downside is that we also do get just a regular USB 2.0 port back here. In terms of I.O., this isn't incredible, but it's not a bad setup either. I just wish that that last USB wasn't 2.0, and I wish that there was a USB-C in the back. I like the front one, but I do also like the one in the back because of the fact that it just makes it a lot easier to hook up a system like this to a dock instead of having it come out of the front. But overall, it's pretty rock solid so as i said it comes with the ryzen 7 7735hs by default it has a stock tdp of 45 watts but i did check the bios and by the way this is one of the most unrestricted bios experiences i've ever had this pretty much gives you access to practically anything that you would want in the bios this is pretty much more control than any other user is ever going to really need. You'd have to be really getting into the nitty gritty of trying to optimize this thing for a very specific task to really want to go that crazy with all of this. But it does give you access to all of that. And in the BIOS, it actually does let you pretty much set the TDP all the way up to whatever you want, really. It did have a option to set it to 54 watts, but it doesn't seem to be a full profile or anything because it didn't really change any of the values. I would still have to manually input them, but that does mean that I could pretty much set it to whatever I want. I could set it to 60, 65. It came with a 120 watt power adapter. So in theory, we should have some headroom there, really the limiting factor just being the cooling system itself. And at the stock setting, it does a decent enough job. Noise wise, it does actually make some noise once the system itself starts to really ramp up. So if you're looking for a silent system this is not it i think that the vast majority of people are going to be fine with the noise level while you're gaming because the level of performance that it gives is really really rock solid but it seems to be in line with all of the other systems that i have tested so far with the 7735hs and the 5800h at these higher tdps now it does have 32 gigabytes of ram and i definitely recommend getting the 32 gigabytes of ram with this specific chip there's just no reason to be at 16 at this point 32 comes with some pretty nice advantages especially on an apu what we can actually do is go into the bios itself and allocate all the way up to 16 gigabytes of dedicated vram to that igpu and pretty much any game that we play is going to think that the graphics chip in here has a full 16 gigabytes of vram to it now it pretty much does because it has access to all of that and it even has access to the full 32 gigabytes if it really needed it see allocating your vram is not necessary 99 percent of the time that's why most systems is, are going to come with a default allocation of less than a gigabyte it's because the systems themselves like the apu chips they're designed to dynamically allocate the ram however they see fit it's why if you play a game on an apu you'll see that your RAM utilization is really, really high. It's pretty much because that RAM is also just acting as VRAM. But there are some very rare cases where some games won't even open unless you have a certain amount of dedicated VRAM allocated. The performance would be identical whether or not the game would launch, essentially. If the game opened on a system with less than a gigabyte allocated and one with 16 gigabytes allocated, the performance is going to be pretty much identical within margin of error but by allocating 16 gigabytes it pretty much means that you're never going to run into any kind of issues in any kind of game if you're the kind of person that plays the same games over and over and over again every single day that might not seem like that great of a feature to you but if you're the kind of person that actually likes to play a wide variety of different games you and your friend group like to just hop on whatever game you guys can find on sale and if you could get pretty much three hours out of the game you feel like you got your money's worth if you're that type of adventurous gamer, then I think allocating 16 gigabytes of RAM or even just eight gigabytes, 16 is just kind of the most extreme 
way of going about it. But if you just allocate eight gigabytes or even four gigabytes, you're pretty much going to save yourself any headaches in any type of title whatsoever. And a lot of the times the iGPU is just going to be the more limiting factor than the VRAM itself. But luckily, the level of performance that we have here is actually good enough that if you're that kind of adventurous gamer that is just jumping from game to game to game, you're at least going to be satisfied most of the time. There's definitely going to be titles that bring a system like this to its knees, but thankfully some of the most popular titles out there tend to be a lot lighter, and especially the ones that end up really blowing up end up being the kind that run perfectly on a system like this. So let's jump on in and actually take a look at what the performance is like on this system before we draw a conclusion. Now, the first game we're going to be taking a look at is Warhammer 40k Dark Tide, a game that I've been sinking a lot of hours into. Now, we're running the game with the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are using FSR 1.0 at the balanced preset. The level of performance that we get out of this is actually pretty impressive, and this game is really interesting because there seems to be a pretty noticeable issue with FSR 2.0 in this game, where FSR 2.0 looks noticeable noticeably worse than FSR 1.0. So FSR 1.0 actually gives you the best level of performance while also looking better. It seems to be a very odd issue. I'm not 100% sure what it is. It could just be a bad implementation within the game itself. But overall, the level of performance that I got out of this was acceptable enough. As you can see, the frame times look rock solid and the 1% lows were decent enough, if not just at the edge of being decent. If our performance was any worse than this, then those 1% lows are going to start to suffer and that's going to become very noticeable. But I was impressed with the result overall, especially considering that this is a game that I have been playing a lot recently. So it's great to see that a little System like this is actually able to handle it. Now another game that I have come back to because of the fact that I still can't play Spider-Man 2 since I don't own a PlayStation 5. I've come back to playing Miles Morales and as you can see the performance that we're getting here is pretty rock solid. We are at the lowest in-game graphics settings and we are using FSR at the performance preset and we are getting some great results here. Those frame times look extremely consistent, those 1% lows are rock solid, and our FPS average is perfect. Overall, I had a lot of fun playing like this, and really you're going to have very little to complain about here. Now I decided to bring out an older title here. We have Metro Last Light running with the maximum graphics settings. Decided to really push the system by going with an older title and really just pushing what it can actually do. And overall, the performance was pretty impressive, especially considering that the game itself, visually speaking, still holds up pretty well today. It's certainly not going to be the most eye-catching game, but I would really struggle to call this an ugly looking game. It looks still really impressive. And overall, I'm really happy with the result considering that we're playing it at graphics settings that are pretty aggressive even for its era. Of course, another title that I wanted to check out was Killing Floor 2. These are pretty much the types of games that I like to play the most. So I decided to give it a go on here, running with the high graphics settings. And the overall result that we get here is actually decently playable. And of course, if you do want to get a higher FPS, you can always drop things down to their lowest in-game graphics settings. I just wanted to give this chip a bit of a challenge, turn things up on a title that I would honestly realistically sit down and play. And the fact that I can actually get the high graphics preset out of this is actually pretty impressive. Of course, a little less impressive is the performance that we got in Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Here we have it running with the medium graphics preset, and we're pretty much struggling to even get a above 30 FPS average, and our 1% lows are really struggling here. In general, not a great result. If we lowered this down to the low graphics settings, then this would be a more than playable experience, but I was hoping that we we would actually be able to turn things up. Unfortunately, that is not the case here. Now, I also decided to take a look at an esports title, and here we have Rainbow Six Siege running with the lowest in game graphics settings, and we are using FSR at the ultra quality preset, so we aren't using performance here. And our 1% lows still look remarkable, our FPS average is still beautiful. Overall, a very impressive result. Now, in terms of CPU performance, this is where the system isn't as impressive. The 7735HS is just a refreshed 
6800H. And what that means is that in terms of CPU performance, we're looking at very similar results to the 5800H. The difference is really within margin of error. So if CPU performance is the most important thing to you, getting a system like the Sur 5 Max is actually better than going with this. The biggest advantage that you're really getting on this system is overall an improved level of efficiency and a significant boost in the iGPU performance. If gaming is very important to you, then maybe consider looking at a system with the 7735HS. But if the CPU is all you care about, then the Sur 5 Max and the Trig Key with the 5800H are pretty much fantastic deals, since in a lot of cases you're looking at almost half the price of this system. So after taking a look at the performance of the system itself, I can pretty much say that I'm actually really happy with this system. Of course, the real crux of this whole system is going to be the price point that it lands on. This is going to be a new system launching, of course, so I will be leaving some links down below. The links might not be live right now if you're watching this, but later down the line, these more than likely will actually lead to the actual product itself. And really, overall, I got to say, I'm, I'm very, very happy with what we have here. In terms of overall performance, it's pretty much where I would expect it to be, which means that we are not thermal throttling on the APU at all. We're pretty much fully utilizing it here. And really, if you're debating on getting this or something like the Sur 6 Max because you think that the higher TDP is really going to make that much of a difference, it really isn't. It is not going to make that drastic of a difference. Not really. If if this ends up being pretty much cheaper than the Sur 6 Max, there's no reason to get the Sur 6 Max because you're not getting better construction. Both of them are really, really well built. Unless you specifically want the kind of design that B-Link went with with the Sur 6, I think that both of them are just really attractive systems and both of them are constructed really, really well. You might like the aesthetic of one over the other, but if build quality is something that you care about, both of them feel very solid. Now, if we just open up the bottom panel here, we could take a look at just how expandable this system is. I don't expect it to have a secondary M.2 port like the Sur 6 does, which is a little disappointing. I definitely would prefer an M.2 slot, but even just having the 2.5 inch adapter so that we can actually mount a SATA SSD, well, that's not too bad itself. Now here inside, we actually see a very interesting approach to everything here. Underneath this heat sink is the M.2 drive. And here it seems like this is actually the CPU cooler itself. Now I'm curious if a drive is supposed to essentially does the whole seem to line up for this to kind of see if I can actually take off this heat sink here? Because it just it seems so large to only be the SSD, just the one M.2. I want to know if there's like a secondary M.2 underneath there or something like that. This this here definitely seems like it's supposed to be a SAT amount. I just I'm not 100% sure how that's supposed to work. Yeah, now, it really just seems like a huge pain to try to get in there. I'm not going to bother going through all of that effort. So I would recommend then if you're trying to get a system like this, that you get it all pre-configured. So pretty much. So really, all I can say about the system at this point is that if it is price competitive, then it is a solid recommendation. I really like it. It is extremely powerful. It is built really nice. I like the design of it. I, I actually really like the design of it. Not the biggest fan of the company logo at the top. If that was removed and it was just completely clean as well as not having the stickers up here, then I think it could look extremely nice. I really like this industrial design to it. Now the RGB really isn't for me, but if you're the type of person that enjoys it, it's there if you don't you could just as easily turn it off and you don't even have to think about it. So don't let that be a deal breaker for you or anything like that. All in all, really solid system. I actually end up recommending it. So check it out down below. I'll see you guys in the next one. Dumb bitch,